Hi everyone and welcome to Sitpo. Uh, I am Dave, I'm from Coventry Skeptics and I will be your host tonight. Uh, we're a group formed out of the pandemic. When we started we were in pubs, we were going and speaking every week and unfortunately the pandemic ended that, which meant that we now have regular talks on science and critical thinking here on Twitch and also on YouTube afterwards. Normally I'd be asking for donations to support our work, but with what's going on in Ukraine at the moment, we're asking you to donate to the same link as normal, so sitp.online slash donate, and all money raised from tonight's talk will go to the UN Refugee Agency, UNHRC. We will also be topping up all donations up to the value of £250, and I ask that you dig deep for this critical work. The format tonight will be the normal format. We will start with uh, the talk. We will then have a break of around 15 minutes. We'll then come back for a Q&A and then end up in the uh, lock-ins razor at our virtual pub. Tonight, we welcome back someone who's spoken to us before. About two years ago, Kit Chapman spoke to us about how elements are named after writing his last book, Super Heavy. Kit has been busy in the last two years re writing his latest book about the technologies that come from racing and are now used to make the world a better place. We've all heard about the technology that came from the space race. This is about the technologies that came from motor racing. If you're looking to buy Kit's book in hardback, then take a look in the chat for a discount code or go to the Bloomsbury website and use the code SITP. Please go wild in the chat for Dr. Kit Chapman. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming along and, uh, and listening to the talk. So I'm going to focus today on motorsport, but I want to begin by telling you a little story. And it's a story that we're all very familiar with. It's the pandemic. Uh, two years ago, I was probably sitting around here talking to you about elements, but the situation in London was quite drastic. We were facing a massive shortage of ventilators. We needed about 10,000 in the UK. It was so bad that the government were even accepting ventilators from the set of Holby City. So incredibly troubling. And one of the people that were approached for the government's ventilator challenge, this challenge to build new ventilators, was Rebecca Shipley. She was approached by a colleague and she worked at UCL in London. And Shipley thought that this was a really bad idea because ventilators have a lot of inherent problems. Once someone is on a ventilator, it is incredibly hard to get them off it. You've also got complications such as having to feed them having to take care when they go to the toilet. Um, you've got the incredible trauma of a patient experiencing something down their throat. So a ventilator really means a hospital bed that's taken up and an incredible cost to the NHS. And while yes, it will save lives, this was not the solution that most patients needed. Shipley approached two of her colleagues. Uh, one was um, Tim Baker, another professor who'd formerly worked in motorsport. And then there was Mervyn Singer, who was a consultant at uh, UCLH Hospitals. And Singer said that he'd spoken to his colleagues in China and Italy, and their experience was that CPAP machines, continuous positive airway pressure machines, mainly used for snoring, really, were ideal uh, stopgap measures. And CPAPs are quite simple in design. They're a mechanical valve. And what they do is they basically give a little extra puff of air to help your lungs inflate. Um, if you think about blowing up a balloon, if you just try and blow the balloon in one breath, it's really quite difficult. And your lungs are far more complicated than balloons. I'm really simplifying things here. But if you give it that little puff of air first and then blow up, it's much easier. That's what CPAP provided. The question was how to build a load of CPAP machines. And so Baker said, you know what, I'm going to call a mate of mine. He phoned up Ben Hodgkinson at Mercedes AMG High Performance Powertrains. And this is the engine supplier for several F1 teams, including, of course, the championship and constructors winning Mercedes Benz. And the Mercedes uh, team said, he, he called his boss, and the Mercedes team came back and said, do not hesitate to call upon the full might of what we can do. Hodgkinson phoned up his three best engineers and told them that they had one hour to get to London. They were going to build CPAP machines. And this is what a CPAP machine looks like. It's actually relatively simple. As I mentioned, it's just valves and switches. Uh, this was the Whisperflow uh, Respironics, uh, sorry, the Respironics Whisperflow. Uh, it was designed decades ago. It was out of patent. 
And they had one in UCLH hospitals. They found it in the museum. They brought it into the lab for the Mercedes engineers to take apart and literally cut it in half and see how it worked. And they went, you know what? We reckon we can probably copy this. They also bought one off eBay. The head of procurement for the Mercedes Formula One team actually went to somebody's house after buying this on eBay, literally turned up on the doorstep uh, and, and collected it rather than having it through the post. Quite a treat if you're an F1 fan. And Hodgkinson set his engineers a task and said, I want this to be replicated within one day. I want a prototype that works, that we can actually manufacture. Well, it didn't take them one day. It took them 26 hours. They were two hours over time. Uh, within three days, they were producing these, whisp these uh, Whisperflow Respironics uh, systems and putting them in patients in hospitals to see if they worked. And remember, they had one hour to get to London. They didn't bring a change of clothes. They didn't bring anything at all. And so someone from the UCL uh, team was sent out to go and find the Mercedes engineers some clothes. I mean, they couldn't just end up spending the same time in, in the same kit. Um, they were working from 5 a.m. until about 1 o'clock in the morning every day. In the end, the only shop they could find in Bloomsbury that was open that was selling T-shirts was selling this sort of tropical pink T-shirt with Ventura written on it. Um, as you can see, modelled by the Mercedes engineers. And so that became the official uniform. That was the, Ven the UCL Ventura project team. And they began to continue their work. Uh, they contacted the MHRA, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. That's the agency in Britain that's in charge of making sure that, uh, that a medical product is fit for use. And they were liaising with them for essentially the next two weeks, proving that their device was exactly the same. It was approved, and they actually had a second device perfecting the design specifically for COVID, making sure that there was no loops that could actually infect anybody else. And both devices were approved within 12 days of that first meeting and that first phone call. Two weeks later, after 30 days, Mercedes, having turned its entire factory that was previously producing engine parts for Formula One cars over to building CPAP machines solely and actually bringing in two giant robots from the government to help them transport stuff around, they successfully built 10,000 medical machines. And bear in mind, they had never seen one of these machines before. They had never had regulatory approval before. Regulatory approval usually takes years. They did it in one month. And that gives you an idea of just how talented an engineer is in a Formula One team. It is astonishing what they can do when they put their minds to it and when they have to do it. Now, Hodgkinson, by the way, is actually the guy on the uh, second from right, if anyone's wondering. Now, you'd think that this is the first time uh, Formula One has any, had any kind of contact with the healthcare uh, body or any kind of things like that. Perhaps just not the case. Great Ormond Street Hospital, uh, its paediatrics unit, uh, actually practices pit stops. So in the early noughties, two consultants were relaxing watching the GP uh, Grand Prix race. And they noticed that the pit stops in Formula One were incredibly coordinated. You know, you remove the tires. So someone basically puts in the gun, it removes the tire. Another person puts the tires back on and off you go. The record for a pit stop in Formula One is 1.82 seconds. And that's held by Red Bull. You can watch the clip on YouTube. It's astonishing. And Great Ormond Street thought about how can we actually use that in surgical theatres? Because 70% of accidents in hospitals occur at the point that the patient is handed over. They finish the surgery, they're moving back to the ward, notes are forgotten or something isn't checked. How can we actually use the expert coordination of Formula One in a surgical unit? And so they sent consultants over to Ferrari who showed them how they organised their pit stops, how they planned it. They went and watched McLaren do it in the UK. And they came up with their own practice, including introducing one of those lollipop man uh, things, you know, those big sort of stop go signs. They had their medical equivalent of that. Today, Great Ormond Street still uses this technique. In Birmingham Children's Hospitals, patients uh, who need cardiac uh, monitors, 
So occasionally uh, children will have cardiac problems that mean they go into cardiac arrest and they need to have some kind of monitor that detects this and prevent, prevents them having a heart attack. Well, previously, these were bulky machines that had to be sort of almost tethering the patient to the bed. Now, Birmingham decided to actually implement uh, cardiac monitors that they could use remotely. And they did this with McLaren's help. Again, it's all about Formula One. Um, to the point that when they actually look at the software that's monitoring the patient and the way they're walking around, it detects that the patient is on their outlap and their tires need refreshing, things like that. But thanks to them, they have mobility on the wards. These kids can walk around and play, uh, not worrying about having a heart attack. It's a fantastic quality of life benefit. Sensors in Formula One aren't just limited to monitoring that kind of thing, of course. Um, there are about 300 sensors on a Formula One car. On a race, uh, it will actually transmit about 1.5 gigabytes of data. During the whole race weekend, it's about 500 gigabytes of data being transmitted from the car to the pits. So it's an astonishing amount of data, and it's very much a data-driven business. That's why you see these aerodynamic changes. I mean, today, for example, Mercedes were testing out their new aerodynamic wings, and they basically just removed two parts and used something completely different. They're getting data from it. And so everyone's going to be watching whether or not that works. We have Williams and the baby pod. Uh, that's shown in your picture. It's in the foreground. That is an incubator, essentially. So one of the big problems with uh, pediatric care is if you have a preterm baby born, it needs incredibly intensive care, and most hospitals can't provide it. How do you transport the baby safely uh, to the intensive care unit. The, previously, if you used an incubator, it's an incredible weight. You can't transport it by helicopter, for example. So it's quite difficult to move. And of course, the weight means that there's only so much you can do with it. It's, it's, it's very difficult to actually monitor because you've got to sort of cut down on what you um, are carrying along with it. The Williams baby pod uses technology to keep drivers safe. Uh, it's padded and secure, and there's Kevlar weave in there, things like that. So the baby is nice and safe and secure. It weighs only eight kilograms. And so that means you can transport equipment with it. And finally, I mentioned the ventilator challenge right at the start. Well, McLaren and Red Bull and all the other teams, they were also involved in the ventilator challenge. Um, in fact, some of them went ran into dead ends, but McLaren, they were part of the large UK consortium that ended up producing all of the ventilators the government needed. And they coordinated it and organized it. They produced tens of thousands of parts and not a single one of them had a design flaw. Every single one of them was perfect. So Formula One has worked in healthcare before and it helped massively during the COVID pandemic. Potentially, it might have uh, prevented London from suffering a major first wave disaster where beds were just occupied. And of course, safety continues in Formula One. Um, I've got a, a selection of images here. Um, safe gun handling. People often don't think about the pit crews when we talk about Formula One. But of course, they're using these incredible machines. Up until the early noughties, a pit crew uh, guy lasted maybe five years. And by the time he was 40, he had no uh, he had no strength whatsoever in his arms because the gun would recoil because of the incre incredible pressures. So we've now got these incredibly designed gloves that protect the hands and also have sensors in them to tell you what's happening to make sure that your person isn't injured while you're actually just changing your tire. That same sensors are used elsewhere uh, in other in other uh, fields. Um, which is coming from NASCAR. We have Safer Barriers and the Hands Device. So Safer is essentially a system of barriers that when someone impacts, it helps absorb the impact. There are harder and softer barriers. And in fact, we're using steel in it. People often thought, this is a bad idea, we shouldn't be using metal. Why not, if it helps catch the car? There's often a, a misconception of how barriers are used. It's not about sort of preventing the car from crashing off and sort of the, and the impact, it's about lowering that impact, slowing the car down, catching it and preventing it to sort of hitting something really, really hard. It's all about using up that energy. We've also got the hands device. So people will be very familiar, I'm sure, with the death of Ayrton Senna in 1994, and that just changed motor racing forever. We're going to discuss that a little bit later on. But before that, we had the death, oh, sorry, after that, we had the death of Dale Earnhardt, and that was in 
uh, NASCAR. He was the biggest figure. He was the man in black. And Earhart was uh, driving around in Daytona and he crashed into, uh, well, essentially got clipped by another car, ended up crashing into the wall. His bonnet started sl- slamming into, uh, into the windscreen. It is a horrific crash. And he didn't survive. He suffered what's called a bacilla neck fracture. And this is the same fracture that other NASCAR drivers have uh, died from. They actually suffered four deaths in in the space of about 18 months. And in 1994, we had Roland Ratzenberger, who died the same weekend as Ayrton Senna. He suffered bacilla neck fracture. Essentially, it's a, a broken neck. And so the hands device is essentially that shoulder tether that I'm sure you've seen. Uh, and it's got a, a tether attached to the helmet so that you cannot hyperextend your neck. It basically keeps people alive and not breaking their neck. This is far from the only safety measure that we've seen come out of motorsport. Um, People might be familiar with the death of Lawrence Arabia uh, driving around in a motorcycle and he had a crash. He wasn't wearing a helmet. Hugh Cairns, who was the surgeon who was operating on Lawrence of Arabia, um, became in the Second World War in charge of uh, British medical care. And he started looking at how to innovate And he did a lot of things. He introduced neurological units um, and neurosurgery into British soldiers, um, sort of medical core uh, facilities. And that was during the Second World War. That's why the British suffered far less head wounds than any other country in the Second World War in terms of fatality. They, They did suffer the head wounds. They survived. But he wrote a paper in 1940 uh, looking at uh, courier riders, dispatch riders. And he realized that, uh, Essentially, if you wore a helmet, you wouldn't die if you crashed. Although um, people still kept driving around until the 1970s in the UK uh, not wearing helmets, thanks to Cairns' work during the Second World War, now today many lives are saved because of safety helmets. So we have all of that going on. We've got para-aramids and meta-aramids, two very, very similar types of uh, material. Para-aramids, we're looking at things like Nomex, we see there uh, a engineer on fire. That's actually one of the pit crew. Um, very, very famous image. Nomex is flame retardant and will resist fire for a certain period of time, allowing you to get out. Meta aramids, things like Kevlar, for example, which was actually discovered by um, a woman. She was a, a medical student um, that was basically working at uh, DuPont part time to try and a little bit for medical school. And she ends up discovering Kevlar. So incredibly important discovery. And finally, we've got the halo uh, saving the life there of Lewis Hamilton. You can see Max Verstappen's tyre literally landing on him and he is absolutely fine. That's a titanium beam and that titanium beam can withstand about 16 cars on top of it. So incredibly strong. But these are just some of the things that we need to discuss. This isn't all about safety, this talk, because race innovations have been with us since the beginning, uh, in the far left there, that picture is essentially the first purpose-built race car. It was built to break the land speed record, which was previously held by cars that already existed. The guy driving it is Camille Giannazzi. He was a Belgian, uh, an electrical engineer, and he wanted to prove uh, that his taxis in Paris were great. He was just trying to sort of sell more taxis. And so he thought that he would win the, the land speed record off a guy called uh, uh, the Marquis Gaston de chesloups um, who was the electric count. And given electrical engineer and electric count, you might have guessed it. The first ever land speed records were held by electric cars. It wasn't until com- uh, combustion didn't come for a couple of years later before in terms of, um, of actually sort of doing any kind of speeds whatsoever. And uh, Genazzi's car, the Jamais Contente, that was actually, uh, sorry, never satisfied. That was a veiled insult at his mother-in-law, not actually about him trying to break the land speed record. That was the first car to do over 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour. So a real milestone there. Uh, And that was in uh, uh, 1898. So not even in the 20th century. 1913, we have Jules Gou there entering the Indianapolis 500. It was the first time that the Indianapolis 500 accepted foreign entrance. And Gou's team was Le Charlatan, uh, the charlatans from uh, Peugeot. They were the first people to actually look at maximizing surface area of the intake and outtake valves 
um, in your uh, your engine, the ICE, the internal combustion engine. And just by increasing the surface area of how of what's opening and what's closing, how much gas and um, sorry petrol. Uh, keep doing this for talk for Americans, how much petrol and air you can get in and then exhaust gas getting out, you can make your engine much more efficient. Jules was going around the Indianapolis 500. He won the race by 13 minutes uh, compared with the, uh, the second place car. The third place car actually caught fire going around on the final lap. That was quite epic, but it wasn't as good as what Jules was up to because while he was driving around, occasionally stopping for pit stops, he would pick up a bottle of champagne and he is an, and his engineer were getting plastered as they drove around. They still won by 13 minutes. And finally, we have the first ever woman racer from Britain. That's Dorothy Levitt. Uh, she wrote a book for women in 1909, um, which was a, a chatty little handbook for women who motor or want to motor um, the, the woman and the car. And she was fabulous. Inside her book is just packed with all these weird historical gems that we would never consider today. For example, she recommended whenever you're driving around the country to always carry a Colt pistol in case a man bothers you. And then you just point it and off he pops. However, one of the things she did recommend that women adopt was an innovation that men hadn't even considered. She thought, why don't you take a pocket mirror with you so you can hold it up occasionally and see what's coming behind? It was the invention of the rear view mirror. So even something as basic as that in autosport comes from racing in some way. But racing isn't about just car innovations. If we look at the anatomy of a Formula One car, four areas we're gonna talk about, tires, the body, the aerodynamics, and the engine, all have applications well beyond um, road. It's not just about cars at all. And of course, when we look at the anatomy of a Formula One car, we also need to talk about the team. Um, so we've got the on-track team there. You might think that that is probably representative of Mercedes, not even close. This is the Mercedes team. In fact, that's the Mercedes team several years ago because you've got Nicky Lauda and uh, Nico Rosberg in the photos. So the team that's actually delivering these innovations is huge. But let's break down into the areas I've mentioned. We've got the tires, we've got the body, we've got the aerodynamics, we've got the engine. I'm going to start with the tires because this is an incredibly tragic story and one that I really like telling because people seem to think that science makes you successful by overnight. It really, really doesn't. So let's go back to the 1830s and rubber. Rubber, uh, natural rubber, comes from the Javier uh, tree, Javier Brasiliensis, it is the power rubber tree and it grows along the Amazon River in Brazil. And the reason rubber is great is that it's sap uh, from this tree, the white liquidy kind of latex. It contains cis 14 polyisoprene. And this is an incredibly long molecule and it's almost in cis configuration. So there are cis and trans configurations in chemistry. Essentially, they're mirror images. If you imagine looking at yourself in the mirror, one of you would be cis, one of you would be trans. And this cis 14 polyisoprene was fantastic because usually it's in sort of almost like a ball, it's a mess, but if you stress it, stretch it out, those long track chains allow you to stretch it. And of course, then it snaps back. So in America in the 1830s, they started looking at this. The Roxbury Rubber Company uh, really invested very, very heavily. But the problem with natural rubber is that it operates in a certain temperature band. And this is because and natural latex is really there to discourage predators. It's all about creating a sticky surface that insects don't like. And so as soon as there was a heat wave, the Roxbury Rubber Company's whole crop just melted. It was gone. So how do we actually make it so that rubber can actually hold shape, that it's actually useful? The guy who cracked the problem was Charles Goodyear. And Charles Goodyear pretty much bankrupted himself for decades trying to do this. Um, he ended up having his family in a New York tenement block because they couldn't afford to live anywhere else. He was doing experiments in one of the bedrooms. They ended up moving out to Massachusetts, Woburn, Massachusetts. Um, his daughters didn't have food, and so local farmers were giving them butter. He was kind of considered a joke and a really bad father because he couldn't provide for his family. He couldn't solve the rubber problem. 
And one day he went down to the local store and he thought that he had the solution. He coated his rubber in sulfur and he was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. Everyone started laughing at him and Goodyear was so angry. He pulled the rubber from his pocket and he started waving it at them and it fell out of his hand, flew across the room and it landed on the stove. And that heated up and created essentially sulfur bridges, bridges that linked these cis-1,4 polyisoprene layers together with sulfur. This was the discovery of what we call vulcanization. And because of these sulfur bridges between the strands, it was only so far it could stretch and it would return to the shape that you had created for it. Suddenly we could create tires, we could create um, rubbers, as, as in sort of the eraser rubbers. We could create uh, shock repellents and, and basically things that protect skyscrapers. It was incredibly useful. Now, this was all good, well and good. Charles Goodyear made nothing at all from this. You've heard of the Goodyear Tire Company? Well, someone just stole his name. He has absolutely nothing to do with that company. He was awarded the Legion of Merit by France. Um, he couldn't collect it from Napoleon III because he was in debtor's prison for, for unpaid hotel bills. Charles Goodyear died in, 1860s, in the 1860 penniless. He was actually hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. But tyres, of course, we need natural rubber. We also use synthetic rubber. And there's a big question about where tyres come from. This is probably worth talking about. I actually went down the Amazon rainforest, uh, down the Amazon River. I sailed it all the way from, uh, from the entrance uh, in Belém all the way down to Manaus, which is about three days on a boat to go and find rubber plantations. There's me with an indigenous American. And originally, as I mentioned, it grows in Brazil. But Brazil was suffering from blight, and it wasn't really, uh, it was a monopoly. The big nations didn't like the fact that little colonial power Brazil had this monopoly on rubber, and so started looking for other ways to circumvent that. Now, in Brazil, uh, Americans actually invested heavily. Henry Ford is a classic example. Uh, he set up a, a town called Fordlandia in the middle of the jungles in Santarém, where he tried to grow rubber for the Ford uh, Motor Company in the uh, early 20th century. It didn't work. He tried to force his, uh, his workers to only eat hamburgers and American food. They rebelled. But the British, we were the real dickheads, to put it mildly. There was a guy called Henry Wickham. And Wickham, much like his namesake in Pride and Prejudice, was a bit of a wrong one. He went to Santa Rem and he gathered up seeds from the plantations, hundreds of, of, of you know of these seeds, ended up with ten, several 10,000 10, of them. He shipped them back as academic specimens. He promised he wasn't going to do anything with them, but he shipped them back to Kew Gardens and Kew Gardens were able to breed those seeds and grow rubber trees. And so the British then took those rubber trees and we planted them in Southeast Asia, where we controlled all the rubber crop. And today, the number one producer of rubber in the world is Thailand. Um, but the big problem is because we have created all of these trees from just a handful of seeds, they are all clones. So if one of them dies from a tree blight, it's likely their neighbors will die as well. And in fact, that happened two years ago. We lost 5% of the world's crop from a tree blight. So it's incredibly fragile, this industry. We need to look at alternatives. And millions of people have died for rubber. Um, people might be very familiar with the Belgian Congo. Leopold II, king of the Belgians at the, uh, the Congress of Vienna. Essentially, when they were carving up Africa, he got the Belgian Congo as his private reserve. And he forced people to grow uh, rubber tree, well, rubber vines, actually, um, for him. If they didn't meet their quotas, their hands were cut off. Uh, Ten million people died in the Congo trying to get rubber. So it's important that we diversify this industry. And the good news is we can, because there are about a thousand different species of plant that grow some form of latex, some form of rubber. And one of the most famous is the dandelion. So Taraxcum coxigaz, that's the Kazakh dandelion, the Russian dandelion it's known as, but we're not going to call it that tonight. And you can make tires from it. In fact, Continental have. This is an extreme e-car and its tires are made from dandelions. There's also something called the wahuli shrub that's being looked at in North America that grows in the deserts. 
And so the Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico and Arizona states like that and New Mexico, they can grow Wahuli shrub in huge quantities. Even so, even these alternatives to rubber so that we can actually bring down the, the carbon footprint of transporting rubber, we can bring down the, uh, the climate change effect of the, the heavily polluting industries of, of demolishing these, uh, these uh, plantations and harvesting the rubber crop. And of course, the incredible ecological impact of actually growing plantations in jungle and removing that jungle. Even though we can now diversify it with Russian dandelion in Europe, we can grow that along uh, the borders of motorways, or we can grow wahuli in deserts, they still have awful stories. Wahuli was force grown by Japanese Americans who were interned during the Second World War. While Taraxacum, the Russian dandelion, was investigated by Nazi Germany during the Second World War because they had no access to rubber alternatives. It was grown at a place called Reichko, a small subcamp of Auschwitz, uh, by about 150 women. They were all PhDs. They were kidnapped and forcibly put into this work camp. And of course, in January 1945, when Auschwitz shut down, they were forced on a death march. So rubber is intrinsically linked to, by my count, three different genocides. Does anyone know who the number one tyre producer is in the world? That's a, a lovely bit of trivia that might brighten the mood. The number one tr producer of tyres in the world is Lego. <laughs> you think about the number of tyres they produce for their sets. Um, but let's move on, because the extreme e-car I'm showing you is actually really fascinating. That body is the natural colour of the car. It's not been spray-painted or anything like that. And the reason for that is the bodywork, which we're going to move on to, is made from linen, it's flax. So flax can actually be used in motorsport. We've already seen Porsches being created from it and other cars entirely. And flax in this particular configuration is already used in Formula One. Since 2021, you've been able to use flax, hemp, cotton, and bamboo uh, legally in your car. And what they do is very similar to vines on the back of a leaf that strengthen that leaf. They created a, a grid network and that means that the flax is as bendable, as malleable, and as strong as carbon fiber. It's also incredibly light, of course, and it's cheaper, and it's even better for the environment because carbon fiber is incredibly pollutant and, uh, and harmful to actually create. So we're already seeing uh, linen and flax. It's made from the same stuff as your pillows, just in a, a slightly different weave um, in Formula One. Lando Norris's seat is made from it um, because seats in Formula One, for those who don't know, uh, every driver has to weigh with his seat at least 80 kilograms. It's a way to try and make sure you just don't put in a really light driver and gain a few seconds on the track. So Lando Norris, he is a light driver. His seat needs ballast. And so they just created it out of essentially uh, flax and hemp, uh, woven it together. And that's what he sits on. But we can go even better than that when it comes to the body of a Formula One car. People might be very familiar with this story, but it's always a fun one to tell. It's the invention of a substance called graphene. And two people won the Nobel Prize for it, Andre Guillem and Konstantin Novoselov, who was a Guillem student at Nijmegen, actually. And Andre Guillem, up until about 2003, 2004, was best known uh, for frogs because he had what's called the Friday Night Experiment. He liked to muck around with science and see what he could do. And one day he was playing around with the concept of diamagnetism, which is essentially that everything um, that is affected by a magnetic field has a little opposing force. And he put some drops of water, which is diamagnetic, into the bore of a very, very powerful magnet, turned it on, and lo and behold, the water floated. And so he started thinking, well, I'm mostly water, aren't I? Could I float if the magnet was strong enough? Probably. Um, so he looked at, for an animal that had a very high water to mass ratio. He came across the frog, of course. And so he stuck a frog in a droplet of water and chucked it into the bore of a magnet, an incredibly powerful magnet. And lo and behold, the frog levitated. So that frog in the center there is a floating frog. But Andre Guillem wasn't done there. Because a few years later, on his Friday night experiments, he did something that I imagine a lot of us have done. I know I did it as a kid. He was trying to get someone to polish down a piece of graphite, same stuff you put in a pencil. 
and the student had actually polished it down to the point that it was use, unusable. Now, hands up, I mean, I can't see you, but I'm going to put it on, on faith. Who has ever got a pencil and sort of rubbed it on a piece of paper and then smoothed it out? And you get this lovely, smooth graphite patty. It's almost like a sheen, a grey, shiny sheen. Well, Gim was talking to someone and, and they said, we calibrate our, our, our equipment using essentially a piece of scotch tape that has graphite on it. We sort of get the graphite, we rub it on some scotch tape, we peel it off, and lo and behold, we've got something we can actually use as a test sample. In fact, we've got the strips of, uh, of graphite over there if you want, and help yourself. Gein went into the bin, he picked out a piece of scotch tape with some graphite on it, and he stuck it under a microscope. Now, graphite has lots and lots and lots of thin layers, and the reason that it can be a very effective pencil is that when you rub something down, you're essentially brushing off a layer and leaving that mark. But Gein managed to actually get it down to a single layer and have a look at it. And it looks something like this. It is a, a two-dimensional object. It is one atom thin, and it is essentially chicken wire, atomic chicken wire. Because each of those carbon atoms, they're all carbon, is bonded by what's called sigma bond, an incredibly tight covalent bond to three other carbons. And that means, like chicken wire, you can pick up this sheet, you can bend it, you can twist it, you can make it malleable. It's got huge thermal electrical conductivity, it's but it's also incredibly strong. Because if anyone has tried to punch through chicken wire, you cannot do it. It's incredibly tough. Now, we can't imagine quite where graphene is going to take us. It's really, really hard for us because it's the same as a Victorian discovering plastics. Plastics, remember, is a single string of carbon atoms, essentially. We're now talking about a sheet. So we're adding another dimension there. And so while the Victorian can't imagine all of the things we use plastic for today, and you look around your house, you're going to find loads and loads of plastic, you and I have no concept of where graphene will take us because it's an astonishing material. There are several things it could take us, though, and we're already seeing it in sport, and motorsport in particular is leading the way. So we have graphene crash helmets, for example. As I mentioned, incredibly strong and easy to shape. It's incredibly good at protecting the head. We have graphene circuits that are essentially just pieces of paper. You can write whatever you want on it. You can make a computer circuit that is foldable paper. Incredibly light. We have incredibly light sports bikes made of graphene. And that means that high-performance um, high uh, athletes, elite sports athletes, have incredibly light but incredibly strong bikes. So imagine a Formula One car, because we're going to see this technology tested out in Formula One and elite sport long before it reaches the road. Imagine a Formula One car made of graphene. Imagine how light that would be and yet how strong, how much you can take away from the car because the driver will still be protected. Imagine the circuits being made of graphene so that it's far more conductive. Imagine you've got that in your re uh, recovering energy systems that you're using brakes, for example, you're at your MG UK. Imagine you use that uh, in your lubricants and you use that in your coolant so you can actually use the incredible properties of carbon to take away that, that heat from your engines. Graphene is really going to change and revolutionize our worlds. And Formula One is already looking at it. Other motorsport is already looking at it. That is where we're going to see the change. In the same way, we're also going to see the first changes in 3D printing. Um, this is me in a Shelby Cobra. Very, very famous car, of course. Um, it was at, this one was actually driven by Bob Bundurant, um, who it was one of the people in Ford versus Ferrari uh, racing around the track, if, uh, if you've seen that movie. Um, he was one of the people that was they, they were playing. Um, he actually sort of won them on. Um, he was also a Formula One racing driver, drove with Jackie Stewart around Spa, all that kind of thing. And so to share a cockpit with him is just a treat. But that car, that Shelby Cobra, ignoring the tyres and the engine, is entirely 3D printed. It took three weeks. It was designed by the US Department of Energy. They can now 3D print Shelby Cobras. In fact, that's not even the coolest thing that they're 3D printing. They've got a, a room up at the University of Maine. They have 3D printed a submarine. 
an entire submarine. Um, because they're 3D printing it, you don't have to worry about supporting joints and things like that. You can just basically make it hollow. You can tell the computer where to leave gaps. And so you can create these incredible structures. I actually saw a robotic arm uh, used on a mini sub in that department. And they had created all of the hydraulic systems by basically just telling the computer not to print that. And so there are no moving parts. They've just got a, an effective hydraulic system that has been 3D printed and it's ready to go. Um, so fewer uh, problems. They can repair now uh, diesel engines. Incredibly expensive to repair an engine because any no one no one crack is the same. Now they can just 3D print whatever the crack is and just repair it overnight. No problem at all. So bodywork, we're seeing incredibly exciting things. And again, all of this technology already in Formula One. But what about aerodynamics? Surely we can't use aerodynamics from a Formula One car in our daily lives. Well, we know that aerodynamics in Formula One is the most important thing. People who are following F1 are probably aware that we've moved to what's called ground effect this year. Really exciting innovation. It's going to be fascinating to see what the teams come up with. But the F1 aerodynamics at the moment are so good that a Formula One car has so much downforce, it could drive upside down in a tunnel. And as long as there were no bumps and your engine could actually work, they wouldn't fall off. They would stick. Uh, Laurie Winkless is the real expert on, on sticky stuff. And I think her talk is still available online. So you can drive an F1 car upside down, no problem at all. I've seen someone take the wheel of an F1 car and all the aerodynamics are inside it, put it up to the ceiling, use a vacuum cleaner to create a vacuum, suck off the uh, the energy. Um, that was an inappropriate use of suck off, but never mind. Actually, no, that was an appropriate use. And then I've seen this tiny engineer guy just jump up and grab onto the tire and try and pull it off the roof and hang. He has made a tire not only stick to the roof, but stick to the roof and take his weight. So the aero packages are fantastic. And what if we can take that and we can use it in some other space? Well, we can. Computational fluid dynamics is essentially the computer modeling of airflow um, and, and fluids. So air and liquids, they're both fluids and we can model them very, very easily. Companies such as Worth have started looking at this already. Over on the right, you've got a bobsleigh. The British team that won the uh, the bobsleigh two Olympics back, two Winter Olympics, they, they, came, they got bronze, sorry. Um, they used uh, technology from Formula One uh, and Formula One CFD modeling to actually improve their bobsleigh. Worth, who worked in, um, they were part of the, uh, the Mana Marussia Virgin team. Um, and Worth actually originally had a, a team in 1994 as well, before CFD came out. They do computer modeling now for a lot of other companies. They've 3D, mod they've 3D modeled uh, a, a, an Eddie Stobart truck to make that more aerodynamic so that they can reduce the carbon footprint. They've 3D modeled in the middle there. We've got Chicago. What they do is they work on skyscraper design, not only to improve airflow and sort of make sure that you've got uh, sort of comfortable heating and things like that without actually having the heating on and having the air conditioner on. That obviously reduces carbon footprint. They also prevent uh, what's called sort of wash. So they can control the airflow so that it doesn't blow down and create those corridors where you're sort of battling against the air as you go past two buildings. That doesn't happen anymore in modern buildings because CFD is used to model all of the airflow around every single building, create the city of London and actually see where their air goes. And over on the left, that is a supermarket freezer. You can absolutely model the flow, airflow in a supermarket freezer. And so a freezer unit, essentially the air uh, goes in the bottom, gets cooled down, comes out of the top nice and cold, and it keeps your food at uh, nice uh, temperature that means the bacteria can't harm it. Well, people have to reach into those open freezer units. And of course, the shelving units themselves are sort of in the way of that airflow. And usually what you get is turbulence, it spills out. So you get cold feet because the cold air is getting down there. But of course, you're also wasting CO2, you're creating a carbon footprint, and you're creating higher energy bills because you're losing all of that cold air. You're having to sort of make more air cold. Well, why not use F1 technology to fix that? And so Sainsbury's and many other supermarkets do. Uh, that is Sainsbury's installing the one millionth fridge using F1 technology by Williams. Um, and they have that, a very thin strand 
in front of all the shelving units. You can see it pretty much in any supermarket in the UK if you go to the freezer units. Um, and you can see how this extra wing has been added on. And all it does is it captures in that cold air and sort of brings it back in. And that means that rather than having the natural chaotic flow that you get from a, a waterfall covered in rocks, for example, instead you get the Trevi fountain. You get this nice smooth curve of airflow. And it's exactly the same air and liquid. doesn't really matter. We're talking about fluids. So that basically recaptures the air. And of course, you can model other things as well. Uh, Carolyn Hargrove, formerly of McLaren, she was actually a chief technology officer for, applied, for McLaren Applied uh, Technologies. She was the person who introduced simulator racing into Formula One. When she did it, uh, 2005, uh, she was working for McLaren, and Juan Pablo Montoya still holds the lap record uh, for the Turkish Grand Prix because he had been driving it for months in simulators before any other driver. The McLarens absolutely dominated that weekend. She's now looking at the concept of what's called digital twins, creating a virtual version of you so that you can test out healthcare technologies and see if they will improve your quality of life. So we can model all kinds of things straight from Formula One technology. Almost last but not least, we've got the power units. I'm sort of spinning up a little bit because we missed out a, a big chunk of the talk and uh, I don't want to keep you from, uh, from your dinner. But we're already seeing new technologies, not just the internal combustion engine being used in motorsport. One of the big bugbears I have is, well, it's just these gas guzzling cars, right, going around the track. Absolutely not. It's the world's fastest R&D lab. And of course, we've got Formula E, which has lithium ion batteries. Um, Formula One also has batteries. We're in the turbo hybrid era. But today we have 350 kilowatt engines, 470 brake horsepower and 40 percent of the energy used by those batteries in the race, in a Formula E race, is recovered through what's called regenerative, regenerative braking. Very similar to Kerr's. Um, in fact, the regenerative braking that they use is almost similar to the original iteration of Kerr's in Formula One. I don't really have time, unfortunately, to go into how they're doing it. So we're already using lithium ion batteries and electric cars are making the return. And not above time too, as I mentioned, of course, the first proper racing car was electric. And part of this is because of the lithium ion battery. Um, this won the Nobel Prize only a couple of years ago. It's an absolutely fabulous design. Again, unfortunately, I, I just realized I'm running out of time, so I don't have to uh, have time to go into all of the complexities of the battery. But how we got from uh, the basic battery that we use up chemically, because a battery is a chemical store of electricity, essentially. It's a chemical store of energy. So we then create a circuit, forcing electrons to go around it and creating a current. Um, we took that, and the first people that were looking at rechargeable back batteries, renewable lithium-ion batteries, was an oil company. It was Exxon. So they realized that oil is going to run out. They were already looking at electric batteries. They couldn't actually get it to work. Um, what that was happening was lithium spikes were crossing over the circuit and basically causing a short. So it took until 1991 and uh, Akira Yoshino um, producing batteries. Sony uh, ended up putting out the first lithium-ion battery. Essentially, it is a barrier across the middle of the electrolyte, which prevents those lithium spikes. And also they did some changes around cobalt oxide was introduced by uh, John Goodenough uh, after Whittingham, who was the guy that was working for Exxon. And then Yoshino introduced the petroleum coke and essentially the lithium uh, ions ferry around and then just reverse direction when the battery needs recharging. And in motorsport, we're already pushing boundaries in terms of electric cars. We talk about them not being fast or, or them not working. A long time ago, that would have been right. Ten years ago, that would have been right. Formula E, when it first came out, actually had to stop a race halfway through and the drivers had to get out and get into another car because their batteries didn't last. They didn't have the range. Today, they do. And we have the world's fastest electric car, the Venturi Buckeye Bullet 3. In 2016, that hit 341.4 miles per hour. They are already looking at going over 400 miles per hour. If they do so they will be not only the first electric car to do it, they'll be the first car that isn't driven by turbo engines. It isn't sort of basically a plane on wheels. And in fact, you could almost ask, argue that they is probably the, the only true car 
Because if you stick a load of, uh, of thrusters, like thrust SSC or blood hand or something like that, and blast off uh, essentially a rocket car, there's no proof that that's actually on the ground. The wheels might well be off. I'm sure people remember that Russian plane that skims along the surface of the, uh, the ocean. But of course, electric isn't the only option. We also have things like hydrogen power. We have biofuels. Formula One has already moved to 10% ethanol this season, uh, E10. Um, it's going to phase out, ideally, uh, fuel in the next decade. It's looking at synthetic fuels as well. Paddy Lowe, very, very famous uh, team member in Formula One, he's actually gone into what's called zero petroleum, and he's looking at manufacturing uh, hydrocarbons that you can use as petrol, essentially by taking water, splitting it with an electrolyzer, powering that electrolyzer with renewable energy so that there isn't a carbon footprint. Um, you can do that along the coast of Chile because there's huge, huge uh, winds coming there, the roaring 40s, they're called. And then when you combine that with some carbon dioxide, uh, using techniques called the reverse water gas shift uh, process, which we're going to use in Mars to, uh, to get water. Uh, we, we need that for our astronauts. Taking that process, adding in something else called the Fischer-Tropsch reactor, uh, Fischer-Tropsch process, which is high heat, um, we can create hydrocarbons. We can create fuels. We don't need fossil fuels anymore. Um, and so that gives us a, a waypoint te uh, technology. It gives us a technology that allows us to transition from the road cars we have today to whatever we drive in the future. But I think we drive in the future. That is probably the last place that I want to end on because it might not be us driving. This, as I'm sure many of you will know, uh, is Ayrton Senna. In 1994, uh, in May 1994, Ayrton Senna died at the San Marino Grand Prix. Um, and it was one of the shocking moments of my childhood. And Ayrton Senna, people have, for years have, have said, why isn't there any footage on board for, of his crash? The answer is that the race cameras at the time weren't able to do that. They had to sort of beam out over to a controller and then the controller would decide which picture to run from. They beamed up to helicopters uh, and down because of interference from the metal around the track. And so one of the few patents that Formula One has is the ability to actually beam out information across complicated metal twisting circuits, incredibly useful for cities. So, for example, this was at the Macau Grand Prix in uh, 2017, I think it was, um, and it was a huge pileup. Uh, it was, um, sorry, it wasn't the uh, Macau Grand Prix, it was the Mac Macau GT World Cup. And um, the FAA GT World Cup had this, that's millions of millions of pounds of cars crashed because one stalled on track right next to a tight bend and every other car piled into it. They couldn't avoid it. If we had that technology that we've now sort of patented because of the death of Senna, because we needed that ability to have that black box information and broadcast it around a circuit, we can allow cars to talk to each other. And that is a key part of AI racing. They have LiDAR sensors. They are able to tell exactly where they are, but they can also talk to other remote vehicles. And already this is being tested. Uh, we have a, something called Robo Race that actually races AI cars. It's predominantly team-based. But once a season, they invite Lucas Degrassi, Formula One driver, Formula E world champion, um, along, and he races against an AI car. And the lap times, he's still winning, the lap times are now so close that the AI car would qualify for entering a Grand Prix. They were, it was within 5%. And that means that by speeding up, by going really, really fast, by proving that we can actually talk to cars in, in incredible speeds going around 150, 200 miles per hour, when we slow that down to our road cars, it's much more effective and much safer than it is going the other way starting off slow and getting faster and faster and faster. So by practicing on the track, by learning how these technologies are going to work, we can actually really implement AI cars and uh, essentially driverless cars in the very near future. And that's going to be very much more to do with racing than it is anything to do with Elon Musk or Google. You're going to see some fascinating changes in the next five to 10 years. And the majority of them are going to have some fingerprints uh, from uh, racing and motorsport.
Thank you very much for listening. I really apologize for that massive uh, uh, drop in the middle there. Um, technology, what can I do? But I've been Kit Chapman from Falmouth University, and this uh, is Racing Green. Thank you so much, Kit. That was absolutely brilliant. I absolutely love listening to that. Um, if you want more information on what Kit's just talked about, obviously we've got the Q&A coming up, but also you might want to look at buying his book, Racing Green, uh, which you can get from the Bloomsbury website. And there is a discount code SITP, which will give you 25% off the hardback book. So have a look in the chat. The links are all there. Um, apart from that, we will now take a 15 minute break. We're back at uh, 8.15 uh, for the Q&A. So thank you very much. And I'll see you all shortly. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, so we're going to start with the Q&A with Kit very shortly. Um, I'll start with a couple of small updates. Uh, first one is that just to mention that local groups are starting to do their own events again now. So um, please feel free to have a look around, see what your local group is doing. If you're not sure, reach out to one of the mods, and I'm sure they'll be able to point you in the direction of the nearest group. Um, we also have been collecting money tonight for uh, the UK um, UNHCR. Um, we have currently raised so far between you £437. Fantastic effort. We will also be adding 250 of our own to that. So great work. Please keep the money coming in. It's a mass really, really good thing uh, that we're doing here. Um, from there, we will now move on to the Q&A with Kit. So uh, please welcome Kit back. And I think we'll just start off with the first question. So the first question comes from Don, the taxi driver. Um, what do you think will be the next technical or safety advancement that will come from motor racing to public cars? Oh, really interesting. Um, so we know it's not going to be something like um, uh, sort of uh, re re regenerative braking turbochargers because they're actually looking at almost removing turbochargers entirely. I think what we're going to see is more efficient electric cars. Um, one thing we're looking at in Formula E already is uh, inductive charging, whether you can literally just drive over, charge, and then move on. Um, we might see that in the next sort of maybe five to ten years. But in terms of the, the immediate impact, it's probably stuff that's already on track, and I think it's probably going to come from Formula E. So, things, uh, for example, um, there was a Land Rover update uh, where they actually just mailed every single car the updates based on uh, Formula E performance, uh, and that improved cars by 1.5% uh, every single car. So being able to actually just contact cars wirelessly and just improve them um, just based on race data alone is something that we're going to see constantly now. Um, so that will be the next one, and we won't even notice it. And I'm sure your, your taxi will just be better and better and better. Absolutely. And I, I think this very much falls into one of those categories that's going to answer one of the big questions that's come up tonight. I've had a lot of people asking in the chat on here as well. And um, the, um, oh, I've lost it. Sorry, bear with me one second. Um, questions are moving around. Ah, uh, so Andrew in Peterborough asks, uh, forget, forgive my bluntness, but while it's great that F1 Tech is helping us, do, uh, helping us, does this make up for how their arguably unnecessary emissions must do for climate change? That's a very good question. I mean, bear in mind that given that it is essentially 20 cars going around on track, of course, you've got the whole circus around that as well. And that was something I didn't look at in the book. I wanted to. I wanted to go to Silverstone and say, what's the carbon impact of essentially 100,000 people overnight descending on a place and actually creating a city? Uh, because there's a huge carbon footprint right there uh, that we really need to look at. Um, uh, the answer comes back to uh, a very famous quote in a movie, The Third Man. Um, there's this awesome Wells quote where he uh, he says, you know, uh, Italy, Italy had sort of centuries of war and they invented, you know, the Renaissance. Switzerland had centuries of peace. They invented the cuckoo clock. It's a little harsh on Switzerland, that one. Um, but ultimately, innovation comes from striving and trying to outbeat somebody. It comes from competition. And the two main thrusters for that in humanity are sport and war. And I personally would much rather see innovation from sport than from war. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned earlier in the intro, you know, that a lot of technology came from the space race. That's the famous one that, again, massively wasteful when you look at the amount of emissions. Which, which and again, if we think about it, that was a war. That was part of the Cold War. It was a propaganda exercise as much as a scientific endeavor. And so it's always, where's the competition coming from? And sport is, is the great outlet for humanity. And 
Formula One, again, I, I touch on this in the book, spirals out into so many other sports. Um, the reason that we excel in cycling now, or we've had skeleton bob teams that were successful, is from technology from Formula One. They actually worked with the Formula One teams. So don't just think of it as just the cars going around the track. Think of it as so much more than that. And again, think about where you actually want that uh, that competition to lie. Sport is a much preferable alternative. Looking at it from another perspective as well, um, there's the whole a 1% improvement on an F1 car doesn't make a huge, it makes a difference to their race, but the 1% energy saving you can make off every single t- car by having a slightly improved tire or these minor improvements that it may cost thousands of uh, kilograms of CO2 to make, to do the development. How many grams of CO2 is going to be it's, saved? It's the, it's the economies of scale. Um, the other thing we're looking at is moving away from the IC, the in, internal combustion engine. And so you mentioned it's incredibly polluting, and absolutely you're right, it is. Although Formula One cars, it's worth pointing out, have actually reached 50% thermal efficiency, which is something that a road car has never done. So that means that uh, essentially 50% of the effective energy that you could get out of that engine is actually being produced on track. When you look at a motorsport, a motor car, you're looking at maybe 30%. Um, And so being able to improve the efficiency of engines through innovations that have come from motor racing will actually reduce carbon emissions and make your cars more efficient. You can go further on less. Um, and I mean, that leads to the improvements with lithium ion batteries that we talked mm-hmm. about earlier. And yep, yep. Uh, Slava Ukraini asks, isn't mining lithium for batteries also very polluting? What's coming from more environmentally yeah. friendly batteries? Uh, lithium ion batteries uh, actually producing lithium is incredibly polluting um so a lithium ion battery is isn't just lithium it's a lithium cobalt and nickel um we also have issues with conflict metals because obviously cobalt we're getting from the congo uh and there are some incredibly dodgy people that we're getting you know so these metals from um lithium is the 33rd most abundant element on earth but it is also one of the ones that we are going to run out of if we just use it in batteries for everything from laptops, mobile phones, uh, I'm sure everyone has a lithium ion battery somewhere in their house. There are alternatives, though, and that's the good news. One thing we're looking at at the moment is sodium ion. Um, so sodium we can just get from the sea. I mean, NaCl is salt. We can just get sodium. There's loads and loads of it. The challenge is that sodium is a much bigger atom than lithium. And so that means it's not quite as effective as slotting in Again, I always hate using this thing because it looks it looks really dodgy. Um, but uh, lithium ions slot in between gaps, basically, in, in the uh, the anode and the cathode, and that's how they're stored and, and they can return. And that's how they're not used up. That's why the battery is renew- um, rechargeable and, and uh, doesn't lose its, uh, its sort of power. Sodium, it's much more difficult to do that. But we have got functioning sodium ion batteries. If we can move to that, fantastic. We just don't have to do lithium mining anymore on the scale we're currently doing. And also, I assume as the technology improves for the uh, uh, energy density in there, you're using less lithium anyway because you're creating yeah. less batteries. I mean, energy energy density is a really interesting thing because we're not just looking at energy density. Um, Formula One predominantly looks at power density. Um, and it's seen a huge increase in power density because that's what Formula One wants. They want the, the power now so they can push forward. Something like Formula E looks more at energy density, which is more related to road cars, but that because that increases your range. That's essentially you can go longer and longer and longer. Uh, it's your energizer butter battery kind of, kind of, you know, it keeps going and going and going. Um, we are seeing improvements in there, but the interesting thing is we're not actually looking at improvements too much to the technology. There is some, um, and also the composition of the metals, things like that. It's actually about the configuration of the batteries. So originally, uh, Formula E raced on sort of almost little packets that were configured into a stack, and that was created, um, I think, by Williams. We've now moved over to batteries that are essentially put in a trapezoid shape. And just by configuring the shape of the battery so it's more effectively cooled uh, and more effectively configured um, and you can manage it better, we can actually increase the range. So it's it's all of these technologies aren't just about sort of improving the fundamental, the basic technologies. It's very much applied science. How can we actually improve the configurations? Uh, we now have a question from Igor, which is, what's the most weird and unexpected bleeding out of car-related science in other fields of technology? 
A weird and unre- unexpected one. I mean, I was fascinated by by sim racing. I didn't realize that sim racing essentially spawned out this kind of virtual human. Um, and when we look at sim racing, that that came from David Coulthard complaining about his Xbox having better graphics than the McLaren driving simulator. Um, so I always loved that one. Uh, I mean, there there are so many sort of little technologies that you don't expect. I didn't expect half of the the healthcare devices. The fact that we're now monitoring kids with you know, cardiac problems based on Formula One sensors. For me, that's a huge benefit because having worked in hospital, I used to, I trained as a pharmacist. Um, knowing the situation that kids are on pediatrics wards, it's heartbreaking. And so anything that can give them a little bit of quality of life it, that makes their life um, more like being a kid rather than being a patient is just an infinite boon as far as I'm concerned. And so to be able to actually go around and play and not be at risk of a heart attack, to actually have this monitor going on, for me, that just that was a game changer. See, I also um, I work in retail, so I am very used to uh, seeing fins on the top of uh, uh, fridges um, and freezers. Yeah. And frankly, I've never seen a rollout quicker because they realized just how much money they were going to save. Yeah, they 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 send they save an insane amount of CO, CO2, but also energy bills. It just yeah. slashes your energy bills. Um, but that for me is a weird one because who thinks about supermarket fridges when you're looking at a Formula One car? Well, the really interesting one is is what's happening at the moment there. So it's already been trialed over in the Wirral. Um, they're now using the same technology, the same Formula One CFD devices. Um, they're investigating how to basically keep air inside the supermarkets. So supermarket doors are actually going to have Formula One technology in them to basically prevent cold air leaking leaking in and cooling the supermarket and i mean that kind of industry is one that is a lot of money there is a lot of co2 in supermarkets in retail yes. generally of course and, it's going to make how that actually change. came about um so there's a, there's a an easy con- misconception to make which is that formula one looks at this and goes hey we can use this in supermarkets that doesn't happen um, this one came about by Worth actually approaching Marks and Spencer saying, we designed this airflow for um, Eddie Stobart trucks. Can we put it on Marks and Spencer trucks? Yeah. Um, we've had a look at it. You've got these kind of fancy wings and we don't think they're very, very good. Uh, we've run our tests. And Marks and Spencer came back and went, well, we're quite happy with the wings on our cars, thanks. But could you solve our fridge problem? And so that kind of sort of smart thinking and connectivity it doesn't happen just instantly and so the next big thing could be something that no one is thinking about yet and someone will suddenly make the connection and it'll revolutionize our lives absolutely um moving on to a question from gray the earthling um can f1 offer insight into efficient running of public transport for example modeling throughput of trams metros or buses yes uh, it can so it's already being done by the united states department of energy um, this is actually Formula One. This is um, General Motorsports, so NASCAR. Um, the NASCAR does a lot of modeling uh, from the supercomputer at the Ohio State University. And the Ohio State University has something called the CAR, the, um, uh, uh, was it, uh, I, can't, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's, it, it's called CAR. It's yeah. their, uh, their, motor, their motor area. And they have been working on what's called SPAT uh, design uh, and synchronizing. Can you synchronize the, uh, the traffic lights um, with AI cars and, and driverless cars so that a driverless car knows that it can slow down by one mile per hour and by then it misses actually stopping at a red light. It goes straight through the green. And by doing that, of course, you're preventing all of the, the wasteful energy of having to brake and then having to start the engine again. You can keep it at a, a steady speed and actually reduce your emissions. So that's already being investigated. Um, particularly in public transport. The United States Department of Energy is investing millions in this and we're seeing real benefits. They're going to start implementing that on some of their buses. Williams uh, invented, uh, so people might remember KERS, um, the first iteration of KERS in the early noughties. Very different from the KERS we have today. Uh, KERS is Kinetic Energy Recovery System. And Williams decided to use a flywheel, which is basically a giant spinny wheel that takes a bit to get going, but once it's going, it's very good at storing energy. It just keeps rotating because it's got very little friction. And they had to get rid of it because the next year they changed the regulations and they needed a bigger fuel tank because you couldn't refuel. Um, So they never really used it in Formula One. But the Williams flywheel is actually used on London transport. It's used in London buses. 
um, so that the buses actually have these because they've got the space and they actually recover energy from their braking and that's used to power their electric batteries. So you're already seeing that in transport. And I mean, moving slightly further on from that, uh, Gray the Earth thing again asks, um, how applicable is F1 derived technology to human power transport like cycling? I know you mentioned like, it a bit. <laughs> like cycling. So we've already spoken a little bit about the fact that, you know, Mark Cavendish's bike is CFD and governed and all that kind of stuff. In terms of human power transport, um, where they did the work was actually in power delivery. So it's all about the pedals. So he's a sprinter. And so you want the maximum power going down on the pedal so you get the biggest push with the sprint. And they used CFD and, and, and F1 technology to develop that. That started rolling out into pro bikes. And, of course, anything that rolls out into pro bikes, as we've seen with mountain bikes and hybrid bikes and all kinds of bikes, will eventually trickle down to the consumer. So eventually F1-inspired uh, pedal technology will be appearing in your bikes. I mean, even things like uh, the technology used for carbon fiber and things to make things lighter and stronger. Absolutely, the top racing yeah, bikes are and, using. As I said, carbon fiber isn't even going to be a thing anymore. I mean, carbon fiber is fantastic, but it is not very environmentally effective. So if we can move to flax, uh, the company is called B-Comp, um, B-C-O-M-P, and they're based in Switzerland. And they're really leading the charge on this. And they're already looking at this. They've actually built a bridge in the Netherlands using flax which is astonishing when you think about what they're actually doing. So we're really going to see a whole revolution in in smart materials and just better use of materials that we, we sort of almost gave up on because we thought we were too modern. Well, guess what? The ancients had it right. Um, a question from Igor is, um, which links back, back to your previous point, which was about re regulation. Do heavy regulations around what is allowed to be part of a racing car help innovating process or limit Ooh. it? That's a really good question. In fact, someone someone asked me this not too long back. It's important to remember that Formula One is a formula. So you have to go to the formula, which is the regulations. Um, I think that actually heavy regulations encourages engineers to think in smart ways. And what they do with the regulations very carefully is they design them so that they're channeling the engineers to think in certain ways. Um, and we see people constantly looking for loopholes and suddenly come up with great ideas. So today we saw it with Mercedes. If anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, if you go on Twitter, type in, you know, Mercedes uh, Aerodynamics, or um, I think Karen Horner is trending, which is uh, an insult to the Red Bull boss because he's been complaining about it. Mercedes has seen a gap in the uh, in the regulations, and they've come up with something we have never seen before, and it looks like it's fantastic. Uh, we saw that in 2009 when Braun absolutely dominated the championship. Um, tiny team, they were based out of the Honda team, they were a takeover essentially by the boss, Ross Braun, and they dominated because they had what's called a double diffuser, uh, a very smart way of having essentially Venetian blinds in the bottom of your car that allowed the airflow to go, uh, the airflow to go through. And so engineers use these formula guidelines, but they're always looking for loopholes. They want to be the smartest one. And if you think back right to the start of, I mean, beyond Formula One and everything, if you go back to ancient Rome, the word ingenium doesn't mean someone who plays with engines. It means cleverness and intelligence and smartness. And so it's all about cunning ways to get around these regulations. So I personally think the formula actually basically channels innovation in very interesting ways. Excellent. Um, so, um, moving on to a question from Anonymous. Um, can all these huge, costly teams of clever people be diverted into making trains as sexy, efficient, as innovative as cars, please? <laughs> um, I think that the key thing with trains is you can't race a train because you've got tracks, essentially. Um, you, need, you need that competition. Where's the, where's the competition coming from? Um, we are seeing innovations trickling into trains. Um, I mentioned, obviously, regenerative braking. The uh, the Delhi subway system uses regenerative braking, saves a huge amount of CO2. Um, and funnily enough, um, when I was talking about 3D printing earlier, the 3D printing design at the University of Maine, the actual printer, is big enough to do two train carriages. That's their definition. Um, so there's no reason that we couldn't see certain things in trains. And of course, trains in terms of um, CO2 emissions per passenger is much lower than a Formula One car and things like that. But right now, we're not seeing too much of it. Um, I'm sorry for, for train aficionados. 
Um, moving on to a question from Grimbid, we have racing focuses on speed, but in the real world, we need range and quick charging. Any good advances there coming from motorsport? I think we've briefly covered it slightly, but I think there's more. Well, on we that. have covered that with Formula E, yeah. We, we, I mean, as I mentioned, it's all about power density, energy density, and Formula E, because of its nature, is looking at energy density, and that is where we're going to get the, uh, the range in charge. And that leads me to a question from Garnet, which is, uh, is there much crossover between Formula One and Formula E research? And do you think that investment and slash research in Formula E will overtake Formula One anytime soon? So the answer is no, and it's deliberate. Um, so Formula E, the way they've actually designed their cars is they don't have to worry about aerodynamics. And the reason they do that is because Formula One, almost you know, the vast majority of a Formula One car's budget is on aerodynamics, because that's where they gain half a second you know, or, or a tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second over the competition. So the two formulas have actually very deliberately separated out so that there isn't that, 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 that move. But if you have a look at the personnel, the majority of personnel in Formula E have probably worked in Formula One at one point or other. When you look at the drivers, almost all the drivers in Formula E have either been you know, a test driver or a backup driver from Formula One and they just dropped into the series or they've been a Formula One driver and they've dropped in. So there is huge crossover there in personnel and in skills, but very, very deliberately, the two formulas have diverged and they're looking at different things. And on that same matter of the divergence, um, something that you briefly covered, unfortunately, I think you ran about a bit out of time so you couldn't cover it as much as I'd have liked, um, is Extreme E, which is yes. a completely different kettle of fish, but really interesting and yeah, talk so about it it's extreme e is is the brainchild of the same guy who came up with uh, formula e which is Alejandro agag now he's a sort of very mercurial chap but but extreme e uh, the idea was to go to places that are in endangered essentially that, that are climate threatened so they were looking at uh, a shire in argentina greenland uh, santa Rem in brazil and and the amazon rainforest things like that and then to do some sort of off-road racing. It's essentially rally racing. What they set it up as was there was one male driver, one female driver. So there is parity built into the sport. And they each do um, part, of the, uh, part of the qualifying and racing themselves. And uh, the, the cars themselves, the tyres are made of dandelions. The body is made of this flax fibre that I've spoken about. They're electric cars. And the cool thing about Extreme E is they're showing that electric cars can be charged, are viable, in the middle of the Amazon jungle or on a glacier or in the middle of the desert. And if they can do that, then obviously there's no argument about having uh, you know, power units down in uh, you know, Taunton Services or wherever they happen to be. I mean, if, if they can charge a Formula E car or an extreme E car, sorry, in the middle of the desert, you can absolutely do it uh, and build that infrastructure across Europe and, and, and Britain. But yeah, they are very much an environmentally focused um, formula. They are FIA approved uh, and they are looking at, I mean, they transport everything in one ship, uh, which used to be the St. Helena mail ship. So the RMS St. Helena basically drives the everything around. Um, yeah, they, they really try and cut down their carbon footprint and show what you can do. The other thing that uh, from reading a book that I got from that was, but also it's driving different technology improvements. It's driving, can it function at minus 30 degrees? Can it function yeah. at plus 40? Is it, you know, what are the tyres going to do when it comes to dealing with sand versus dealing with snow? Because they only allow one set of tyres, right? Or yeah, they only have tire. one set of tyres and it's got to deal with, you know, gravel and asphalt in, the, in Dorset right down to, you know, a shire in Argentina or, or jungles of Brazil. The whole point is, is how do you actually get take that engine that, that's powering it uh, and the Williams guys had to come up with an engine that would work in the desert that they could repair easily because they don't have the parts. Um, and again, this this boils down to actual usability. So one of the big challenges we have is electric cars in Britain aren't going to save the world. But electric cars in India and China and the Middle East, everywhere else, that's far more than we are. There's one billion cars, you know, ICE cars in the world. We really need to look at actually how do we actually help everyone in the world rather than just our small corner of it. And being able to demonstrate the technology and being able to show that we can actually get electric car engines that are functioning at high performance, incredible high performance, 
going over dunes and falling over and all kinds of dust and debris and sand and grit and gravel and snow landing in there and still going, you know, the sort of the Land Rover mentality, if you like. If we can get that, we can actually show that anyone can have electric cars and that removes all the arguments. Um, Garnet's back again with um, with electric vehicles seen as the short to medium term uh, solution and hydrogen as the medium to long term. Are there any plans for some kind of Formula H? There are no plans for Formula H, but we are going to see uh, hydrogen cars in Le Mans. Uh, so 2024, they're, they're going to be allowed. Uh, we have a team in, in Delft, University of Delft uh, in ne the Netherlands. They have what's called Forza 8. They're moving to Forza 9. That is a hydrogen powered race car. It is already beating it's petrol rival equivalents. So we are moving to hydrogen very, very quickly. And there are some rumors uh, within Formula One, not general public knowledge, but the question is, what are we gonna do after the internal combustion engine? They can't go into electric car racing because that's Formula E. And so are they gonna move to synthetic fuels? Possibly, uh, but hydrogen fuel is being seriously considered. So we could see hydrogen in Formula One. Uh, Don, the taxi driver's back. Uh, he's asking now, uh, is it money or logistics that stops proven safety technology, such as safety barriers and flip flaps and foam door inserts, as well as the halo device from F1 making it into consumer cars? Um, well, I mean, the reason that your taxi hasn't got a halo device is that you've got a cab, uh, essentially. Um, and one no of helmet. the big reasons is, is applicability. And so a lot of the technologies that are used in Formula One just don't apply to your, race, your road car. Um, in the same way that you don't need a, a hands device, this tether and the helmets, you're not wearing a helmet and you've got an airbag. So there's something that, that functions in the same way. So it's it's not the, there's no easy answer to your question because the question isn't quite right. Sometimes it's just because the technology doesn't directly apply. And I mean, some of those things that he mentioned there, the safer um, barriers, mm. they are in place on motorways, at well, least yeah, a variant so of them. Not in the UK. Um, no? So we are seeing safer barriers implemented in the United States. Um, and that's that some of the states have legislated for safer barriers, um, which is fantastic. But the majority of places don't need safer barriers. That's the thing. We've got to think about where is this technology appropriate? Um, someone asked me, you know, why why don't we have gravel across every single inch of a, a racetrack off, off the side of it? You know, so the car can skid down. The problem is the gravel is going to fly everywhere and it's going to shower everyone and that could hurt people. So sometimes concrete is your best answer because it takes the car and it catches it and the car loses its momentum through friction and energy is dissipated and it skids along the side of the concrete. And concrete's great if you don't want your car to turn at a 90 degree angle. Um, because that's when the head-on collision occurs. So if it's along a straight, for example, concrete's fantastic because no one's going to crash headlong into it because they're not going to turn sideways. Um, so it's all about the applicability and the suitability of the technology. And for some places, safer barriers will be absolutely fantastic, and we are already seeing them. In some places, they're just not needed. So we're down to the last couple of questions. Um, so okay. I'm going to ask... Um, question for disseminator which is if you had a giant sheet of graphene and you punched it would it break or would it break you um if you had a giant sheet of graphene and you punched it uh, it would depend on the depth of the graphene so if you're punching a single molecule thin layer of graphene you would punch the graphene if there's enough graphene stacked up in there or you punch it from the sheet side rather than the flat side you know you got to think about that um, then the graphene very much would would punch you. Um, and, and I love the fact that you've gone for that kind of, um, you know, in Soviet Russia joke. Um, <laughs> yeah. Nice on theme. Um, and the final question, which I feel like it's more of a starting point for several things you might have to say. <laughs> so um, how long before, before F1 tech uh, ad advances the point that cars will be racing without drivers? Driverless racing. Um, so the big challenge with the big challenge with with driverless racing, we're in. We're already looking at, as I mentioned, a Robo race, and every year Lucas Degrassi sits down and he races an AI car. It absolutely happens, and the AI car hasn't beaten him yet, but it will. It will beat him. We're predicting two to three years the AI car will beat Lucas Degrassi on a dry circuit, because that's the killer. The AI is up racing at optimum conditions. The one thing that it can't do right now that humans just can because we have been, you know, evolved over millions of years to do that 
is we can react to different road services. We can tell what's going on. We can effectively make changes in the rain. One of the things that I looked at in the book very, very briefly was sim racing. And a friend of mine, um, a guy called um, Martin Short, uh, he's got two kids, um, uh, and Marcus and Morgan, and uh, he shoved Morgan into a car and said, go on then. On a track, he was he was old enough, and he said, you've been sim racing since you were you know tiny. Let's see what you actually do in a proper car. He took him around one lap. He showed him how to do it. And he knew that his, his son had complete understanding of how a car works, what accelerator was, and all that kind of stuff. And he went around the track, and sure enough, the first lap, he was told to go it slow. He never bothered. 100 miles an hour through uh, what's called Gerard's Bend, and uh, he was absolutely fine. And Martin was thinking, oh, something's going to happen here. And sure enough, he caught a little bit of water on the track, and the car started drifting out. And because he had never actually been in a physical car, because he had always done sim racing, he didn't know what it felt like to feel like you were crashing. He didn't understand what, what Martin calls the bum sensation. Uh, and having been around Snetterton at 150 miles an hour, believe me, I know what the bum sensation feels like. It is, it is really weird. Um, but you know when, when the car's sticking out. And sure enough, his son crashed and, and, and he was thinking, oh, my God, I'm a terrible father. Son was absolutely fine, of course, um, and, uh, and is, is still racing to this day. Um, he really loves it. The reason I bring it up is because an AI car doesn't have that bump sensation. It might have the brains. It might have be able to make sort of uh, calls on sort of where it should be going, all that kind of stuff. But the moment that something happens that isn't in its programming, it can't handle it. At AI, uh, one of the Aurora races, uh, we actually had a race where the car, because it had a system fault, just turned the, the steering wheel 90 degrees and just drove into the wall. Um, a human obviously wouldn't do that. And so while it's fantastic at reacting to track conditions that it understands, it doesn't have the ability to look beyond that. And that's the one thing that's lacking right now. That's the advantage that humans have. That won't happen overnight. That's probably going to be a decade away. Fantastic. So uh, thank you so much, Kit, for that. That was absolutely brilliant. Again, get your copy of Racing Green. Um, it's there somewhere. Yeah. Um, the uh, discount code is on our uh, on the pay on our in the chat. Um, it's SITP at the Bloom Three website. Um, and we also uh, I'd also like to remind you that we are still collecting money for um, uh, aid efforts in um, Ukraine. So please make a donation if you can. SITP online slash ask. Apart from that, that's all we have time for tonight. We do have a talk in two weeks' time, which is Kelly Weil talking about off the edge, flat earthers, conspiracy culture, and why people will believe anything. <laughs> so hopefully you'll join us for that in two weeks' time. Otherwise, I will be in the virtual pub afterwards, uh, the Lock-ins Razor. Again, links in the chat. Um, hopefully see you all soon. Good night.